The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, one and all, to Gun Reform Now. This is ReproAction's monthly Act and Learn webinar for the month of June. Um, for those watching this recording in the future, uh, the year is 2023, and uh, we are so happy to have you on um, to learn about a topic that has unfortunately increased in urgency over the years, um, even when the majority of this nation is crying out for reform. Uh, if that sounds familiar to other topics where ProAction has discussed, let's dive in and we can learn more. Uh, so your hosts for today, the first voice you're hearing is going to be different than usual. I am Shireen Shakori. I'm Deputy Director of ReproAction. Um, usually our Executive Director Erin Matson is holding this seat, but she is on sabbatical this summer. So um, this and the next two webinars following will be led by me and a rotating cast of some of my fabulous colleagues. Um, so a bit more about me for now. I use she and her pronouns and I'm based in Washington, D.C. Uh, you can find me increasingly less on Twitter, uh, but when I'm there, I'm at sheer mean, and I will kick it over to Natalie to intro herself. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Like Shereen said, my name is Natalie Newman. I am the executive assistant for ReproAction. I'm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and you can find me on Twitter at Natalie Newman. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, let me get to the next slide. Okay, um, so the agenda for today. First, we have our intro, which is happening right now. Um, next, Natalie will come back on and share the wave tops of the current gun reform landscape nationally, uh, followed by a discussion with our amazing panelist, Angela Farrell Zavala. Uh, we'll then provide some next steps and a tease at our next month's webinar before we open it up to an audience Q&A with Angela. Now, um, if listeners wish to ask Angela any questions at the end, just throw your questions in the question box um, on the GoToMeeting platform you're in, and we'll be sure to get to you. And if you are extending the conversation with us on Twitter, please just keep it flowing under the hashtag ReproAction, um, and I hope to see you there. So before we get into the topic, I'm going to give a brief overview of us, ReproAction, for any newcomers joining us. Uh, we're so happy and lucky to have you. But um, ReproAction is a direct action organization that leads bold action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We are proud to be a member of this space, providing a boldly left flank analysis and a strong desire to hold folks on all sides accountable, whether they are traditionally considered allies or the opposition. Uh, we do this work with an unwavering commitment to principles of nonviolent direct action. And we believe that when we use our tools and strength, our allies grow stronger and the opposition diminishes. So we are making a more favorable climate for reproductive justice in all its forms. Um, and with that, I'll kick it back to Natalie to set us up on gun reform as a reproductive justice issue. Hi again, and thank you for that introduction, Shireen. Here, I'll provide a look at guns nationally and everything that involves, including domestic violence, police violence, pro-gun politics, and so on. So let's dive in. I wanted to first cover what exactly reform is, gun reform is, and how it looks in the United States. I tried to split up each section following this slide, but as you can imagine, they are all interconnected and intersectional. We will be talking about hard topics, so please take care while listening. So first, gun reform refers to any legal measure that aims to prevent or restrict access to the use of guns, particularly firearms. It's simple. States with strong gun laws see less gun violence. The 14 states that have failed to put basic gun protections in place have nearly triple the rate of gun deaths as the eight national gun safety state leaders. The states that have no basic gun protections and thus have nearly triple the rate of gun deaths include Kansas, Missouri, New Hampshire, Kentucky, Alaska, Arizona, and more. 
The gun violence archive has documented 260 mass shootings this year. This was updated in May of 2023, so there have been more since this documentation. This past weekend alone, seven people died in unrelated shootings in and around Indianapolis, and three people died in a Kansas City shooting. Eight people were injured. Every day, 327 people are shot in the United States on average. 22 states in the United States enforce regulation known, regulations known as deadly force laws. These laws vary by state, but generally this means a person may employ deadly force against another if the person reasonably believes that force is necessary to protect a third person or oneself from imminent death or great bodily harm without incurring civil liability for injury to the other. 27 states uphold quote, stand your ground laws. They are also called shoot first laws by folks in the gun reform space, so we'll be using that term from now on. <clears throat> shoot first laws give people license to kill, allowing those who shoot others to obtain immunity, even if they started the confrontation and even when they can safely de-escalate the situation by walking away. Shoot first laws are inherently dangerous because they change the nature of gun violence in the state by encouraging escalations of violence and, according to research, do nothing to deter overall crime. These laws dramatically escalate violence, leading to 150 additional gun deaths each month nationwide. A lot of our research and definitions were provided for our awesome colleagues at Everytown for Gun Safety, so we wanted to shout them out really quick. Every day, 120 Americans are killed with guns, and California ranks highest for gun safety in the nation. Arkansas ranks the lowest. There are a few uh, national leaders in gun reform. California, New York, and Hawaii are three of the national leaders. And national failures um, are Mississippi, Arkansas, and Idaho. According to Brady United, an organization that works to end gun violence, over 117,000 Americans are shot every year. And 2022 was the deadliest year on record for mass shootings. I thought this was important to note um, that the Dickey amend Amendment passed in 1996 prohibited the use of federal funds to advocate or promote gun control, leading to the elimination of all CDC funding to conduct firearm-related research. Federal funding for gun violence and injury prevention resumed in the fiscal year of 2020. Next slide, please. We can't talk about gun violence without talking about policing, full stop. Police shootings can cause a lack of trust between communities and law enforcement. Marginalized communities are more at risk for police violence because of the high amount of interactions between marginalized communities and policing due to over-policing. 95% of the deaths of civilians are caused by police with a firearm. And Black people are nearly three times more likely to be shot and killed by police than their white counterparts. Black men are at a disproportionate high risk for police violence in comparison to others. However, the United States does not collect comprehensive data on lethal force used by police officers. In 2015, the United States government started collecting data on incidents of use of force. Use of force is described as a necessary, quote, court course of action to restore safety in a community when other practices are ineffective with the knowledge that injuries may occur in any use of force incident. According to a database compiled by the Washington Post, law enforcement officers fatally shot nearly 1,000 Black Americans between 2015 and 2018, including at least 96 people who were completely unarmed. While a similar number of unarmed white Americans were fatally shot by police, the racial disparities are clear, given that there are five times as many white Americans as black Americans. There is a long, long history of racism in law enforcement and white voter distrust between marginalized communities and the police in the United States. We unfortunately don't have time to get into that here, but please be aware that this is an overarching theme and is related to gun violence perpetrated by the police. Next slide, please. I'm going to go over some of the intersections of marginalization and how it interacts with guns. Communities of color do bear the brunt of, the brunt of gun violence in the United States. Young Hispanic Americans, ages 15 to 29, represent 4% of the population, yet are victims in 8% of all gun homicides. 
4,700 Latinx people die every year from gun violence in the United States, and roughly 650 Asian and Pacific Islanders are killed in acts of gun violence every year. In 2015, half of all gun homicides took place in just 127 cities across the country, even though these cities contain less than a quarter of the nation's population. These cities have been historically under-resourced and racially segregated. On top of those issues, these cities typically have weak gun laws, lack of access to safe and affordable housing, as well as education and employment opportunities. And these cities also have a history of divestment from public infrastructure. Marginalized communities include children too. In 2022 alone, there were 117, 177 incidents of gun fire on school grounds. Between 2013 and 2022, Every Town for Gun Safety identified a total of 848 incidents of gun fire on school grounds. More than 6,000 children and teens were injured in school shootings in 2022 alone. However, mass shootings of this nature account for less than 1% of all shootings. Disabled people often have systemic problems, systematic problems interacting with law enforcement, and disability plays a large role in a number of police shootings. Disabled individuals make up a third to half of all people killed by law enforcement officers. At least 25% of people shot by police have a mental illness or disability. And people of color in the United States are generally more likely to be disabled or to lack adequate care due to factors like environmental race, racism and poor access to health care, which can and often does happen before any interactions with law enforcement. People living in poverty experience gun violence on a different scale. While firearm homicide is a complex phenomenon driven by multiple factors, Researchers consistently find that it is associated with measures of economic hardship, and it is clear that poverty correlates with gun violence. In a study done in January 2022, it was found that counties with a higher level of poverty concentration were linked to increased rates of total firearm deaths, homicides, suicides, and unintentional deaths. Particularly troubling was the fact that over 50% of the firearm-related deaths, as well as to over two-thirds of all homicides tied to firearms, could be linked to living in a county with a higher poverty concentration. LGBTQI people and guns. Many gun violence incidents are bias-motivated or hate-motivated. On average, there are 69 hate crimes committed per day with a firearm. Every town's tra transgender homicide tracker found that homicides of trans and gender nonconforming people in the United States and Puerto Rico have been high for the last several years. Between 2017 and 2022, there were 222 homicides of transgender or nonconforming people, with 2021 standing out as a particularly deadly year. During this period, 74 of trans 74% of trans people killed were killed with a gun. LGBTQIA people, specifically LGBTQIA youth, are at a higher risk of contemplating and attempting suicide. 90% of suicides with a gun are fatal, while 4% without a gun are not fatal. And six out of every 10 gun deaths are suicides. Additionally, since 2013, nearly two thirds of fatal violence towards transgender and gender nonconforming people involved a gun. The overwhelming majority of those victims were black women under the age of 30. Next slide, please. Another way that gun violence is perpetuated or is perpetrated is through domestic violence incidents. Gun violence and domestic violence are inextricably linked. For some of this, I'll be using the term women or women. This is meant to encapsulate cisgender women. Gun violence and other gender identities and sexual identities are vastly underreported and were discussed previously. More than two thirds of mass shootings are domestic violence incidents or are perpetrated by shooters with a history of domestic violence. Domestic violence is violence committed by someone in the victim's inner circle. This can include an intimate partner, immediate family members, close family friends, or ex-partners. The risk of homicide for women that experience domestic violence rises astronomically by 500% when the perpetrator of domestic violence has access to a gun. Abusers with firearms are five times more likely to kill their female victims. 
and every month an average of 70 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner. In more than half of mass shootings over the past decade, the perpetrator shot a current or former intimate partner or family member as a part of the rampage. Guns and intimate partner violence have a disproportionate impact on marginalized women, including American Indian, Alaska Native women, Black and Latino women, as well as pregnant and postpartum women. In addition, the LGBTQIA plus community and people with disabilities are highly vulnerable to severe forms of domestic relationship abuse, but there is alarmingly little data on the intersection of firearms and intimate partner violence among these populations. This is due to underreporting of these incidents to authorities and failure to invest in research that disaggregates data to fully capture the extent of the problem. Nearly 60% of the 749 mass shootings between 2014 and 2019 were either domestic violence attacks or were committed by a person with a history of domestic violence. Nearly two thirds of the domestic violence related mass shootings with four or more people killed since 2015 included at least one child or teen killed. Next slide, please. Anti-abortion politicians and gun reform. Reproductive justice is the framework that allows people to parent, not to parent, and to parent the children we have in safe and healthy communities. Guns in the home and in our communities interfere with this. If we can't raise our children free from gun violence, we will never achieve reproductive freedom or justice. Gun violence, it's a, gun violence is a public health crisis. So is reproductive autonomy. Like abortion bans, gun violence disproportionately impacts marginalized communities. Gun violence also prevents people from being able to make decisions about their families and their futures with autonomy. Reproductive justice and gun reform are interconnected. Politicians that block gun reform also block access to the right to abortion. The conservative stance of being pro-gun but anti-abortion is in fact not hypocrisy. It's in line with their policy plan that enforces violence and control on societies most marginalized, including women, BIPOC, children, the disabled, and more. The same lawmakers that block common sense gun reform legislation block access to abortion. This is not a coincidence. In fact, it's part of the plan. This is a long-standing, deep-rooted effort to control marginalized populations and enforces violence through bodily control and the threat of gun violence. Additionally, some states that are currently advancing anti-LGBTQIA legislation are also dismantling gun safety laws. Anti-abortion lawmakers are generally anti-LGBTQIA. This is connected. Politicians that block gun reform efforts are against reproductive freedom and justice. Again, gun reform and reproductive justice are inextricably connected. Lawmakers must fight for reproductive rights and the right to live and raise children free from gun violence. You cannot have one without the other. To be clear, gun reform is reproductive justice. Next slide, please. The courts and gun reform. These two cases, New York, Rifle, uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin and United States versus Rahimi are instrumental and set a, pre a precedent for how we operate with guns in the United States. I'll leave it up to the experts to talk more about that. And with that, I'll pass it back to Shireen to introduce Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, so, so much for that thorough, sobering, intersectional look at this issue. Um, and now I am incredibly honored to present uh, our panelist, Angela. Um, Angela who Angela Farrell-Zvala serves as the first ever executive director of Moms Demand Action, where she is responsible for leading and growing the largest grassroots network in the gun violence prevention space. Angela has been with the organization since 2019, leading its movement building work, overseeing grassroots organizing, external, cultural, and corporate engagement, and national partnerships and programming. As a lifelong organizer, Angela is passionate about movement building, uplifting and centering often marginalized voices and empowering the next generation of leaders. She is a wife, mother of four and a lover of music, art, dance and theater. Angela, thank you so, so much for joining us today and giving us an hour of your knowledge and insight on these issues you hold so deeply. 
Well, thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be a part of this really important conversation. Thank you so much. Um, to begin, I'd love if you could just briefly describe the state of play in gun violence prevention right now. So what are you concerned about? What are you hopeful for? Just where are we at? Yeah, great question. So there's good and bad news. Let's start with the, the bad news, which we all know in, in, in very much uh, kind of similar when we think about reproductive justice, health and rights movement right now, is that we have a gun lobby and we have extremist lawmakers that are beholden to this gun lobby. And so at every chance they get, they are mounting challenges and really attacking some of the strong gun safety provisions that we have in place and even going as far as being bold and, and besides weakening, proposing things that are going to harm communities in order to advance their guns everywhere for everyone agenda. So that's horrific. But on the other hand, I have a lot of hope because Moms in Men Action, where I am the executive director, we have been around for a little over a decade and we started and it was born out of um, you know, fear, particularly from our, our leader, Shannon Watts, who is the founder of Moms in Men Action, who saw the Sandy Hook incident and the massacre there and was terrified as a mother, as someone that's in her, she's in her home, she has children, how do we not have that happen to us? And our movement has grown so far and so much in that time from just being worried about school shootings or mass shootings, but looking at the holistic way that gun violence is impacting us across this country, being the leading cause of deaths for kids in this country, disproportionately impacting all the communities that you mentioned, but with that, we also understand that we have the majority of support when we think about Americans. They're on our side. Our movement is growing. We have so many legislative wins that we have racked up in the time that we've been here, including uh, in red and purple states and blue states. We're defeating gun lobby back bills 90% of the time for the last seven years in a row. And what I'm most excited about is our volunteers, which a good majority are survivors and our young people. Um, we are running these people for office now. So instead of just advocating for good policy, we actually have folks that we have run. We've won over 140 races up and down tickets, and now they are actually writing good policy. So there's a lot to be hopeful about, but there is a lot of work to be done. I love hearing that. Leading from the place of hope and being proactive versus reactive. These are lessons we are all um, trying to learn and grapple with. Um, thank you so exactly. much for laying all that out. Um, so then looking ahead, what arenas are you focused on for your movement right now? Is it uh, courts, Congress, state houses, the grassroots? Um, and what similarities do you see between where gun violence prevention's movement um, is focusing and um, where we in the reproductive rights and justice space are working? Yeah, so we are going to attack this at every single angle. So from the courts, the Congress, state houses, anywhere that this is under attack, anywhere that our, um, our strong gun laws are being pulled back, or there's any threat to protecting our communities, we're going to be on the scene. So we're doing everything from having our state's teams uh, on every state, plus the District of Columbia, really pushing to, to make sure that in some places we're beating back and we're holding the line. Um, in some places, we're doing really good proactive work and really pushing. I'm really proud I've been able to travel around the country since um, the beginning of this year and met in places like Minnesota and Michigan and Colorado and Illinois and, and Maryland, the list goes on, where we have trifectas because elections matter, y'all. And so we have these incredible trifectas that are really um, proactively uh, pushing for legislation and we're passing laws that are going to protect lives every single day. And I think some of the similarities and overlap is the courts. Of course, we know that the courts, and before I even talk about reproductive justice and um, gun violence prevention, just think about the history in this country where courts have played a major role in making sure that people had rights. I think about civil rights. I always think about you know case studies of other places where we've had to fight and dig in, where there was no real good blueprint. There was no um, promise that someone, our community, our lawmakers were going to wake up one day and decide to grant people rights or expand rights. The courts have always served that in this country. And now we know how important it is and why, again, elections matter because the courts have been stacked uh, over the last, under the last administration or Trump administration. We saw a record number of approving and bringing in 
uh, folks that are going to do damage to a lot of these places and a lot of the things we work so hard for. Uh, and so that we're seeing that with reproductive justice rights and health right now after Dobbs. And frankly, before that, I was at Planned Parenthood for uh, five years before I came to um, Every Time for Gun Safety and Moms of Men Action. And before that, and while I was at Planned Parenthood, was deeply involved in the RJ movement as a board member of Sister Song. I'm now on the board of Sister Reach. Um, and we see the, you know, of course, there's so many similarities. And by the way, and I think you said this, these are the same, the opposition, the same enemy that is really, you know, fighting. And, and I think you mentioned this, they want to talk about pro-life on one hand, which is really restricting access, which is really um, not giving bodily autonomy. And then on the same breath, knowing that this is a leading cause of death for kids and teens and young adults in this country, being really cowardly and not doing what it will take to actually make our community safe. So there is a lot of overlap in this, and it's frankly devastating um, for both of our movements. But we also have, you know, again, I got to bring in hope, y'all. I'm an organizer. We also have growing, growing, and expanding movements. And I'm excited about seeing how we overlap and how we work together to push back on this beast. Absolutely. Something that I hold um, really close to, to how I uh, envision our strategy is that if we are not viewing our topics intersectionally, the opposition is. They see the connection right. in um, all the movements we're fighting for, and they benefit from fracturing them and, and siloing our work. Um, and since we're on intersectionality and the topic of reproductive justice, how does gun violence prevention fit into the RJ movement? You all know this, um, mm -hmm. so I don't have to tell you, but I'll, I'll talk about it with you. Um, we know what RJ means. It means making sure that one, people have access to everything they're gonna need, particularly pertaining to their reproductive health. That's gonna help them to thrive. That means raising children, not having the right to raise a child, having the right to not have a child if you don't want a child, but making sure that there's safe communities to do that and to make those incredibly important decisions, which means access to education, the healthcare, all the pieces that come along with that. And when we think about gun violence, uh, prevention, how does it fit? It's simple. We can't thrive and have safe communities if we are living in fear of our lives. When we have things you talked about, domestic and intimate partner violence, that's a big deal. That is a an, an, uh, reproductive justice issue. We talk about school safety, that's a reproductive justice issue. We talk about walking in our communities, particularly thinking about uh, communities most disproportionately impacted, black and brown communities, and the fact that not just at the school where we have school drills and we're putting this trauma on our children, but even walking from your home to the schoolyard or to the corner store, you're at risk of gun violence. So that is absolutely squarely fitting in a reproductive justice lens and intersecting with it. I also think, you know, being able to raise your family is really important. Um, in safe communities, but when we think about and break down data points, it's not possible when guns are the number one killer of children and teens in America, and when Black Americans experience 12 times the gun homicide and 18 times the gun assault injuries and nearly three times the fatal police shootings of white Americans. So this is squarely in the reproductive justice camp. This is hand in hand, your issue, my issue, um, I also can't um, forget when I was at Planned Parenthood in 2015, there was a mass shooting at a Planned Parenthood health center in Colorado Springs. And I remember, um, in fact, I was pregnant at the time with my um, second to youngest. She's now seven years old. And I remember hearing the news and just being in total shock and awe. Not surprised. I would go to health centers all the time and sometimes volunteer to make sure I was getting patients across the line. Um, but we had now a place where you're trying to seek health care and oftentimes looking for help, looking for uh, a place to get information, to have access and to feel safety and that it was attacked like that is just absolutely was something I couldn't even really fathom. Um, and so again, when extremists have access to guns, the result is deadly. It was in Colorado Springs where three people were murdered and nine were injured and it continues to be that um, if we have access to especially weapons of war in our streets. So. There is absolutely, and I, I could go on all day about the intersections here, and I'm sure you all can draw out more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, snaps to every last point um, you made, and that 
kind of looking at the connections also brings me uh, again back to the connections in our um, opposition. As, as you mentioned, you previously worked in the reproductive rights space. Um, it's, it's just so thrilling for me to see that your advocacy can extend beyond the confines of any one issue area. So what similarities in particularly the ideology do you see between the gun rights movement and the anti-abortion movement? So I'm thinking specifics on um, similarities in tactics, um, the, yeah, talking points, just the ideology they use to push their agenda forward. Yeah, I think a lot of this is very fear-based. Um, when we think about on both sides, but the way that they drum up, because if we really were to do the polling, you all have your polling and data and understand, the majorities in this country, whether we're talking about reproductive health, rights and justice, we're talking about gun violence prevention, agree that this should be accessible when we think about reproductive justice. People should have access to reproductive health care. People, there should not be government interference in making decisions about how you want to move forward in your reproductive life, whether having a child or not. There is strong majorities for that. The same goes for gun violence prevention. People believe that common sense measures are necessary and imperative in this country. And this is a cross party line. This doesn't matter if you're gun, uh, a gun owner or not. And the similarity is striking that we have lawmakers that are beholden to their extremist parts of their movement and they are doing their bidding. They are not following the needs, the wants and desires of the large population in this country that wants to have access to reproductive health care and at the same time be safe and not have to be fearful of their lives when it comes to gun violence in this country. And they're dead set on moving their agenda forward no matter how many people get hurt and die in the process. So it is really scary to see. Um, I also think that um, there's a good amount of crossover here. These, you know, people claim that they're pro-life, and I think you said this, but again, they are not standing up for things that would actually have people prosper in their life. They're really pro-control, they're pro-birth, they're pro um, making sure that there is no bodily autonomy, but this has nothing to do with life because if they really were there for that, and oftentimes I'm going to say this, y'all, I sit back and think about the days that I worked at, I was at Re Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, I was at Planned Parenthood, I worked in the RJ spaces, and the times that I would show up when there were um, rallies and such, when anti-choice um, folks were there uh, and spewing their rhetoric and their hate, and in fact, I, I would go to these sometimes when I was pregnant and I would get hate even towards me. So they don't care about life because as a pregnant person, uh, they certainly were not afraid um, to attack me. But one of the things um, that, was, that I always go back to when I'm sitting and looking at the fact that we have 120 people shot and killed every single day in this country, that I'm going around the country talking to survivors, is where in the world are those people that would show up in front of clinics or show up at rallies and proclaim that they are pro-life. But in these moments where people are literally mourning the loss in their communities, I see none of those folks. So I think you know it's, it's frustrating, but there's lots of similarities there, restricting access to life-saving medical care, pushing forward an agenda where guns can be allowed anywhere from medical centers. We had a shooting, um, there's shootings every day, and, and frankly, I can't always keep up with them, but I will tell you in Atlanta, we had a medical center shooting. And I just thought about, it made me think about Colorado Springs. It made me think about people trying to access healthcare. You can't go to the supermarket, your playground, schools, the list goes on. So there's a lot of overlap. Again, I wanna bring back hope is that there's also more and more people across the country, regardless of party line, that are sick and tired and getting fed up at the ways that these extremists are imposing their will, uh, bidding, doing the, the, the gun lobby, or when think about reproductive justice, doing the extreme and spitting, and really leaving out Americans and others that are saying, we need this, this is important for our community. So we've got a lot of work to do together, and there's a lot of people that are behind us and willing to roll up their sleeves to get to work to push back on this ridiculousness that's happening right now in our country. Absolutely. And I promise I'll start, stop rather, harping <laughs> on our opposition in a minute. But I had one more question. Um, yeah, about, about the tactics they're using. Um, something we see a lot in the anti-abortion movement is that they are 
very much centering their arguments on disinformation. So um, in our work, we see that as um, fake clinics, anti-abortion centers, that's kind of our standout example. Do you see similar misinformation or disinformation from the gun rights movement as well? And where do you think our collective movement voices can be fit into pushing back against the lies and propaganda campaigns? Yes, again, across the board, this disinformation machine um, has been working on, even before we get into thinking about reproductive health and rights and um, gun violence prevention, just look at what happened during the pandemic with COVID. I mean, basic just public health and the way they were spinning and putting out disinformation and really making it so people didn't know what was true, what was not true, fanning the flames of confusion and uncertainty. And by the way, that helped to drive up gun sales. Um, believe it or not, there was a deep connection with that. The gun sales skyrocketed about 64% from 2019 to 2020. So what we're seeing with disinformation is one, with the, with the gun violence prevention movement, is that it requires them to maintain a certain level of fear. Fear is going to sell guns. Fear is going to keep people in a place of you know, not really believing or trusting what's around them. And when you're in that place, the first thing you're going to do is, you know, you're thinking about guns. You're thinking about buying a gun. We had a, just a spike in new gun owners that happened over the pandemic, the course of the pandemic. So I think fear is really crucial to keeping um, control, frankly. And the same goes for reproductive health rights and justice. So we see that. And I think the way that we get out of that is, again, when we do the polling, when we're one on one and having these conversations, and this is why organizing is so critical. You've got to be able to have these breakthrough conversations. You've got to meet people where they are. You've got to be on the ground in communities and having these conversations because oftentimes I have found that my most fruitful conversations have been with people that have not aligned fully with me. And in fact, if I were to at first glance look at somebody and say, okay, they're conservative, they're evangelical, they live here, they believe in this, they're wearing this hat with this symbol. Um, you know, you gotta, you feel a little bit uneasy because especially as a black woman walking through spaces, I don't know, I gotta be careful of who I'm interacting with, but when I step back and just have a human to human conversation, oftentimes I walk away and find out that they are more in line with me than they think. And we are more in line with each other and that they are living like under the sphere. And, and when you have this kind of disinformation machine and when you have things like uh, the, the Twitter world and spaces where you can actually just be in a bubble or in a vacuum, then you don't actually get to break through and, and have understanding uh, our education coming from other places, have interactions and experiences with other people. And so I think that's what the key is. We've got to keep talking to folks. We've got to talk to each other, but we got to do beyond that. We've got to talk outside of these spaces that are comfortable and safe for us. And I know not everyone is equipped and ready to necessarily jump out into places and there are real reasons why um, people are protecting themselves, especially when we think about uh, marginalized communities. Um, but there are people and there are um, folks that have the capacity to do that. And we should do more of it because I think we will find that the majority of people are on our side and we can start to devise campaigns and strategies across the board that are going to attack this from every level possible. 100%. We see the same in talking about um, abortion access and particularly abortion throughout pregnancy. When you approach people from the point of where their values lie, um, we tend to have a lot more in common than we don't. Absolutely. Um, shifting to those who might be less inclined to um, think about the values that humans share, um, Natalie teed up uh, two <laughs> Supreme Court rulings uh, that really changed the yeah. landscape of reproductive rights and of gun violence uh, prevention. Um, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about how the federal courts have shaped our right to lead safe and healthy lives um, through the lens of Dobbs and Bruin decisions. Sure. Well, let's start with Dobbs. Uh, we know that the Dobbs decision, which was, by the way, for the longest time when I worked in the repro world, everyone uh, that wasn't like close inside the repro tent almost saw this as like kind of like hyperbolic that we were saying Roe is under attack or could be. People are like, oh, come on. You know, I was born in 1974. So I was, and I'm talking about myself. Uh, Folks, you know, it was something that just was, it just was when I was born. Um, and I had, I'm a woman who's also had an abortion and I know what it means to be able to have 
access to this. Um, and so I think it was, it's just so troubling to see what happened last summer. I think a lot of us were in complete shock. Uh, and the Dobbs decision threw out nearly 50 years of precedent, which allowed anti-choice extremists to ban abortion in their states and even open the door for these extremists to pass laws that would, this is, I'm going to really push on this, would criminalize providers for providing care or for patients to receive it. Like, can you believe it? I know when I was in the repro world, we used to look at other countries and nations uh, and think about how do we protect uh, these women and people that are uh, having abortions when their, you know, their country is criminalizing providers or criminalizing abortion care or reproductive health care writ, writ large. And now we're thinking about this in our own backyard. This is the United States of America. So it was shocking to say the least. Um, I just didn't expect it to happen this quickly, um, you know, 50 years. So, and then we look at the Bruin decision, which also was kind of the one to gut punch for me uh, last year. And it changed the rule on the rules on how courts can really evaluate gun safety laws. So before Bruin, courts looked at gun safety laws through two different lenses, right? So are they effective in promoting public safety? And also, are they consistent with America's history of firearm, or firearm regulation? And since Bruin decision, extreme judges have really taken this as a cue that they can only upheld, uphold gun safety laws if there's direct historical twin. Now, let's think about that for a second. We're thinking about comparing historically what were gun laws to now without even really diving into the fact that technology has changed, society has changed. People weren't walking around with AR-15s back then, but they're comparing it to historical gun laws, which really is, is scary. And some of these, that means a lot of these judges are really kind of taking it upon themselves to decide what does that mean. And so even if that's not what the Supreme Court said in Bruin, uh, Bruin has really unleashed chaos in our courts and causing even more foundational gun laws to be appended by courts and around the country. And so the result is that courts across our country are coming to very different conclusions on the same issues. Absolutely. Again, snaps to just about every, <laughs> every single line. Um, so since the courts are just growing in this importance in how we negotiate our movements, how we structure our movements, how can we engage our supporters to get involved with what's going on in the courts? Which, like, you know, for me, as a non-lawyer, it can sometimes feel like we're a bit at the mercy of what's going on there and how it's interpreted. Um, but it looks a lot different than calling on accountability for elected officials, which seems more like a place um, for advocates to lay. Um, so yeah, what does that look like in our shared spaces? Yeah, well, I think in order to get us to the place where um, we feel like we have victory, right? And victory means access, reproductive health care and access to all. It means uh, not walking out and being afraid of gun violence uh, in your communities. That's what victory at the end of the day looks like. And so I think that's an ecosystem. When we think about the different approaches, we have a courts approach. We have uh, legislation that looks from everywhere from local all the way up to federal. We have an elections approach, which means we need to make sure that we're getting people elected that are going to actually have the courage and the wherewithal and the will to do exactly what the people need them to do, right? Um, with all of those things, we also need to think about the cultural aspects. And that's where I think education is really important. And it's, it's touched on this a little bit, but you know, when we are having these conversations with folks in communities, when we're, the conversation alone is just a, a, is such an important step forward. And also letting people know that there is something they can do. When you imagine, we don't even have to imagine, let's face it, you turn on the news, you hear about a shooting, you hear about more attacks when it comes to reproductive health rights and justice. And that's not even talking about environment and, immigration, everything under the sun that's happening right now where people have to worry about it. And I think what that means is that sometimes I can create a little bit of inertia. It can create a space where people feel like there's not much that I can do here or, you know, it's, it's really scary and I'm just going to like kind of huddle in, hold things close that mean something to me like my family and just make it through. But the history of this country, particularly with marginalized communities, particularly uh, the fights that we're engaged in, have never been about staying on the sidelines. And yes, is it exhausting? Sure. D 
Does it mean that we can't take breaks our breaths or tap somebody in as needed? Because we don't want to burn ourselves out completely. But I do think that it is quite possible to reignite and re-engage through educating and giving people a pathway to be able to act. That's what organizing is all about. So it's not throwing in the towel. It's doubling down. It's bringing people in. It's telling the stories of impact of this, these extreme decisions by extreme judges and talk about the strategies, not just what's at stake, but the strategies to really kind of overcome them, which I think is really important for people because all they know right now in our hearing is what's at stake or what's happening day to day. But what is the winning strategy? How do we move this forward? How do we do this collectively? How does everyone play a part uh, in, in kind of pushing back and making sure that we're getting to the other side of this. So um, that's really important. And then another plug, we're doing it, uh, Moms Demand Action, Students Demand Action in every town, but also the fact that we need to make sure that we're getting the right people in office, which doesn't mean always that other guy that's running over there. It means us, right? From school boards all the way up to federal office, we should be thinking about building the bench and running our people for office as well, because it's going to take all of us to get to, to where we need to be. And the last thing I'll say is just a little plug. If you all want to jump in, roll up your sleeves, and get involved more uh, with gun violence prevention through Every Time for Gun Safety or Moms Demand Action, you can text READY, that's R-E-A-D-Y, to 64433, and we're happy to get you involved locally. That's what we're so proud about with Moms Demand Action. You can plug in to a group locally and, and really make a difference. I love hearing that, and I particularly loved um, your description of kind of a pathway. Um, I often use the phrase of like an on-ramp to the movement. We cannot um, just expect people to jump in, and that's where organizations like um, Everytown Moms Demand and also where ReproAction hopes to try and plug in for folks. Um, and that's where this webinar today fits in. Um, we want to give people that on-ramp, that easy escalation to continued action with our groups and um, in our movement. So um, I'm going to take a brief moderator privilege and just get our plugs out of the way, and then we can kick it to... Um, our Q&A with uh, the audience. I'll say once again, if you haven't dropped in a question for Angela, there is still time. Um, we have a Q&A box and we will try to get to everyone. Um, I noticed one question in there was about me playing with the cursor too much. I'm very sorry. I did not realize you could see how much I was toggling that cursor. Um, but we will get back to the amazing discussion with Angela. First, I want to um, get you aware of ReproAction's campaigns. You can sign up for our email alerts. Um, find us on social media, ReproAction, pretty much everywhere. Um, if you sign up for our emails, you will hear about our monthly webinars and other programming where we cover the various flavors of reproductive justice and how many issues encompass this movement for justice that we're so proud to be a part of. Um, yeah, follow us on those social media bits and um, you can find out about our next webinar again, which is um, a whimsical topic next month. We'll be discussing tattoos and bodily autonomy. Um, I'm really stoked for this one, just diving into the ways that people claim and reclaim autonomy or just navigate day-to-day -day living in and owning a body. Um, it should be a really affirming discussion. I hope you can tune in. Um, so without further ado, I am going to look at our Q&A box. Um, ooh, this is a heavy one. Um, Angela, what do you think is the most important next step on gun reform? It is very hard to work with superlatives, but I believe you're up to the task. Wow, that is really, <laughs> you all got me there. Um, I think so. I think what, what I would say to that is that we just have to hold the line and really push for ahead. Like we are really, one of the things that we're working on is the banning of assault weapons. Um, we know that there is a reinstatement of the ban. We had this ban um, before and it can work again. I think that's really critical because weapons of war should not be um, on our streets, right? I think another thing on the other, because some people would say when we talk about uh, gun violence, it's, it's multifaceted. I'm talking about not just gun homicides, or uh, we talked about domestic violence. We're also talking about gun suicide, and we're talking about um, safe storage. So I think anything that's going to push on any of those things, like thinking about daily community violence, making sure that we're continuing to invest in the people on the ground, 
the community violence intervention folks that are putting literally their bodies in, in front of bullets to make sure that these um, the communities are safe and that some of the conflict that caused the violence in the first place doesn't continue to play out. I think that is really critical and we saw that happen uh, with the president um, signing into law uh, last summer, the bipartisan um, act that helped us to really think about um, think about in holistic ways how we can start to curb gun violence in this con country. And that's after 30 year logjam, we had a federal um, bill that passed and we were excited and that was part of it, the gun violence prevention um, and the money going to folks on the ground that are doing this work, but also safe storage. So if you're a gun owner, lock it up. We have so many people that get access that don't need it, including young children, um, and really just making sure that we're having these hard conversations uh, and making sure we're getting more people on board to push back against the rhetoric and the disinformation. So I did not answer that with one answer, but there's so many ways to go with this because the problem is so pervasive and it impacts so many communities uh, differently. It disproportionately impacts people of color, but that's with every issue. Um, and so we got to lean in in every way that we can, and I'm going to continue to roll up the sleeves. And the last thing I'll say in my long-winded answer is that um, we've got to focus not just on the laws and policies and elections, but we've got to change the culture around guns in this country. And, and that's something that I'm really looking forward to in the next decade of Moms and Man Action of really digging in there. I love that. Um, I'm going to hit the next question, which is, um, what is an important part of the gun reform uh, movement, policy, um, tactics that people tend to overlook? I think a really important piece, and I think this is so much uh, so also with reproductive health rights and justice, is really having the stories of the impact of being elevated. That is so critical because it's not just numbers, it's not just policy, it's actually lives impacted. And I think that is critical to continue and doing it in a way that doesn't exploit people, but actually lives up, lifts up the lived experiences of folks. And you know, you really can, and I've seen this happen, uh, even in meetings with lawmakers where you have the impact of people speaking, um, and it really does something to, to actually sometimes soften the heart or give courage. I think that's really important. I also think on the, not just on the action side, I think I'd like to also speak to activists that it's really under something that we don't see a lot or, or, or talk about a lot is, uh, and sometimes undervalued is the importance of actually caring for self. We're out here in these streets, like I like, like to say, fighting on all fronts to make sure that access is not taken away and that we are safe in our communities. But that definitely can be depleting and exhausting. So I think that's sometimes overlooked, that this work is heavy, it's hard, it's emotional, but we're all in it because we believe in a safer future, we believe in something better. And so we have to make sure that we're pouring into ourselves and each other to sustain this movement. Because look, this is a marathon, y'all, not a sprint. And so we're gonna need all of us in, and that means all of us have to be cared for. That is so, so important in these times. And I think particularly um, drawing back to what you mentioned before and, you know, people narrowing in on social media spaces or, you know, the isolation of um, the pandemic, particularly the ongoing effects for those who haven't been able to, you know, reenter um, pandemic lists, in quotes, society as some others have, um, I think that causes a lot of people to like, you know, really hone in on what they're doing. Like you said, let inertia take over. And that is true for activists too. It also means that sometimes we don't listen to those um, lived experiences and the storytellers. So um, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, and kind of in that vein, um, I wanted to ask, what advice do you have for activists in both repro space and gun violence prevention spaces, um, tips for sustaining ourselves um, through work that is often really heart-wrenching and um, challenging. Right. Yes, I mean, uh, talk about trauma on all fronts. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to remember that no, no action that you take is too small. Having a conversation with a neighbor, um, doing a phone bank, are getting out in the streets, running for office, it, it can go anyway. There's nothing that's too small. Every contribution is gonna get us closer and closer to where we need to be. So that's deeply critical. I also think that when we think about sustaining this, this movement, um, a couple things. One, like I said earlier, 
don't be afraid to, to think outside of the box or talk to people that you wouldn't usually talk to. It is really easy. I've been in progressive space y'all for a very long time and many different issues. And I think one of the things I love about us is that we think outside of the box. One of the things that's hard for us is that we're often coming into this work because we're trying to protect ourselves. There may have been something that happened to ourselves, our family member, our community. And so we're rolling up our sleeves because we're like, no more. But that also can put you in a place of just being more, much more defensive. And, you know, to the credit of many, like this, this is not with, uh, you know, not unseen that we have a lot of extremism now where people, it just feels like just the bar for what people will, uh, the lengths they'll go to, to harm, just feels like it's out of whack. But I will say, that's what we usually see. That's what we see in media and such. But when you're having conversation with people one-to-one -one or small group, even if they're not someone that you would typically talk to, you'd be surprised what you can accomplish. And then the last thing I'd say to sustain ourselves is that joy is an imperative. Sometimes you feel when you're seeing, when you're frankly seeing loss and death or you're, you're seeing people harmed, it's hard to like figure out, um, should I still feel happiness or access happiness or joy um, or do little things like watching that TV series that I love or reading that good book? Yes, you must. Because if we don't do that, we can't sustain ourselves. I go back and think to my ancestors. The civil rights movement has shaped me in so many ways as far as my organizing. And just thinking about, if you can imagine a time where people didn't have a blueprint, they had no one protecting them. Um, and yet they kept moving themselves forward towards something that they knew was greater and better and out there that they could somehow, even if they didn't touch, that generations after them could. And at the same time knew that they could dance and eat and cook and love and sing and all the things that made them brought them joy and community we have to have community y'all that's the number one strategy for our opposition is to break us apart we have to love self and other and so i think that is important to sustain this movement period that is so beautiful and perfect i think we're at just the right um, note of hope to um, end on. I really appreciate your kind of description of how we all have to take bites of the apple. And sometimes, you know, we're taking a big gulp and sometimes it's a little nibble um, to continue the metaphor that might, that might not be working, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually hungry now. I'm talking about apple. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. This is lunchtime. Um, but yeah, I do, I do think that like seeing that, that whole big, uh, the whole track in front of us as as a line and we are getting to the end but only together um do you have any more lights of hope for us before we close out i think that's it i'm just so proud of all the work that you all are doing keep it up um and i'll see you out in these streets right back at you 100 thank you so much for joining us um and have a great day everyone <laughs>